Okay, in this video, I'm going to continue on with my tutorials, bringing us from electromagnetism to optics. This is video number 24, and I'm going to discuss the reflection and transmission at oblique incidence for an electric field polarized perpendicular to the plane of incidence. This is video number 5 in the subset of videos on the Fresnel equations. So the previous videos to this which are relevant are number 3 in particular, no, excuse me, number 23 in particular because here I discussed when the electric field is polarized parallel to the plane of incidence and I did a very detailed video on this topic so my current video follows directly on from video number 23 so if you feel I've left out anything in video number 24 you can go back to video number 23 to find the answers in video number 22 I discussed Snell's law in video number 21 I discussed the reflection coefficient uh, for light incident on a surface at normal incidence so what we're going to do now is move on from video number 23 quite quickly. So like I said, if, you, if I'm missing any details, you know where to find them now. So the first thing we're going to do is sketch the uh, sketch what's happening. So we've light being incident on some sort of an interface at an oblique incidence, first of all. So let's say that this is the x-axis and we have the z-axis. And what we're going to do is we're going to say that the light is incident, we'll say it's incident at the point z is equal to zero here. But what we want is that the electric field is perpendicular to the plane of incidence. So the plane of incidence is in the xz plane. I haven't drawn it, but the y-axis is also there, so, th so we, we'll have it like this. There's the x-axis, there's the, the z-axis, and here would be the y-axis. So if the electric field is to be perpendicular to the plane of incidence, which is in the xz plane, that means the electric field must have a j-hat component only. So what we're going to draw here is the magnetic field, because let's say we've, here's our light incident on z is equal to zero, here's our light reflected at z is equal to zero, and we have some transmitted light also. If you apply the right-hand rule, Assuming that the the light I've just drawn is the uh, are the propagation vectors k, you'll find that the electric field must be in the j hat direction, and it also means that the magnetic field points in the following directions. So this is the magnetic field reflected, the magnetic field incidence incident. and the magnetic field transmitted. Of course we have our angle of incidence here, theta sub i, but through the law of reflection we know that this here is also theta sub i. Alright, so th that's the important point here. Once you know the direction which the magnetic field is pointing, you're ready to start. Now. We showed in the past that let's say for example we take the electric field incident, let's say E sub i. We can write that as the the initial amplitude E0 sub i multiplied by the complex exponential e to the i k dot r minus omega t. Now I also showed when I discussed Snell's law that the angular frequency for all of these exponentials is constant. So we had that was because all the omega t's had to be equal. And since time is going to be equal, that means all the angular frequencies are equal. So what this means is that all of our exponentials are going to cancel out. So I'm actually we can actually ignore them. So we can cross them straight out. So if we draw the incident electric field, or excuse me, if we write down an equation for the incident electric field, it'll be E0 sub i, but it'll be in the j hat direction. If we talk about the incident magnetic field, bi, b sub i, it's going to be b0 sub i multiplied by some trigonometric cosine and sine terms, which we'll talk about in a second. But if we look, this b0 sub i can be exchanged for e0 sub i over the incident, incident speed, v1. Now, like I said, in video number 23, I discussed how to get the, uh, the actual components for the electric and magnetic fields. So I'm just going to do them here and give you the answers. So if you look carefully, we find the magnetic field has a negative i-hat component here, so it's negative, 
cosine of theta incident in the i hat direction and we have plus sine theta incident in the k hat direction. Then if we look at the electric field reflected, so it's going to be E0 sub R once again in the J hat direction. The magnetic field then is going to be B0 sub R, which we're going to change to E0 sub R over the incident velocity, V1. And we need to multiply once again by the components. So the components this time are going to be cos theta I in the I hat direction. And we're also going to have a sine theta i in the k hat direction. Now, the next thing we need to do, of course, is the electric and magnetic field which are transmitted. So we know, of course, what the electric field transmitted is going to be. It's going to be simply e0 sub i in the k hat, e0 sub t, excuse me, in the k hat direction. That is the j hat direction. So e0 sub transmitted in the j hat direction. And then to get the magnetic field, and the, the terms here is negative cosine sub transmitted in the i hat direction and positive sine theta transmitted in the k hat direction. Okay, so I think we're, we're, we're moving along reasonably okay so far. Like I said, look at video number 23 if you're lost. So the thing we must do now is apply the boundary conditions for the electric and magnetic fields to this. Before we do that, just note something here that the, well, I, I suppose I implied it already, but on this side of the interface, namely the left side of the interface, we have speed V1, and on the right side we have speed V2. So of course we have mu1 as well and mu2, or n1 and n2. So to continue on from here, let's just write down the boundary conditions for the electric and magnetic fields as follows. So first of all, perpendic the electric field perpendicular to the plane of, oh, excuse me, to the interface itself. So the electric field is epsilon1 e1 perpendicular is equal to epsilon 2 e2 perpendicular. So this is perpendicular to the, the interface rather than to the plane of incidence. So we call that equation 1. Then we talk about it being parallel. It's continuous parallel across the boundary. Going to call that equation number 2. Then we have the magnetic field perpendicular, which is continuous across the boundary. I'm going to call that equation 3. And finally, we're going to talk about the uh, parallel component of the magnetic field across the boundary. So it's going to be one. It's going to be b one divided by mu one, and it's going to be equal to one over mu two b two parallel. So this is equation number four. And these are these are our boundary conditions. And all we must do now is sub in the equations we had for the actual electric and magnetic fields themselves. So I'm going to give you the answers here. So first of all, there is no perpendicular component of the electric field. And the reason is as follows. So when we're talking about perpendicular, we're talking about perpendicular to the interface. So the interface occupies the x, y plane. Now the perpendicular component of this, of course, is going to be in the z direction. But the electric field only has a j hat component, therefore it has no component in the z direction. Therefore it has no per perpendicular component. So that means E perpendicular is equal to zero. Also, if you look at the parallel components, we'll find E zero sub I plus E zero sub R is equal to E zero sub T. I'm gonna call that equation number two.
Then let's look at the perpendicular component of the magnetic field. So we're going to get, oh, excuse me now. What we're going to get is E0 sub i over V1 times sine theta i plus E0 sub r over V1. And that's going to be multiplied by sine theta i. And both of those added together is going to be E0 sub t over V2 multiplied by sine theta t. I'm going to call this equation number 3. And last but not least, we need to put together the, uh, the equations for the magnetic field parallel across the boundary. Before I do that, make the substitution as normal, that beta is mu1 v1 over mu2 v2. And that alpha is cos theta t over cos theta i. And if you, if you make those substitutions, you'll get the final equation as being e0 i minus e0 r is equal to alpha times beta e0 t. So this is our fourth and final equation. And what we need to do now is solve for e0 t and e0 r in terms of e0 i. And that's pretty straightforward. I can even do that yourself. So the answers to this will be as follows. We'll find that the amplitude of the magnetic field, or excuse me, of the electric field reflected is going to be the initial electric field amplitude incident. And that needs to be multiplied by one minus alpha beta over one plus alpha beta. And in terms of, and for the, the transmitted electric field, E0 sub t, what we're going to get is that we're, it's E0 sub i multiplied by twice, or excuse me, 2 over 1 plus alpha. Multiplied by beta. So these are our Fresnel equations for the electric field polarized perpendicular to the plane of incidence. Just before I finish, I'd like to point out a very important uh, observation here. The first thing is that we need to look at the magnitude of alpha beta, because depending on its parity or its sign, we'll get either the transmitted wave being in phase and later the reflected wave being in or out of phase. So the transmitted wave is always in phase. But if we look at the reflected wave, it depends on the parity of alpha beta. So if we look back up here, this is our reflected wave. So it depends on whether alpha beta is positive or, or is greater than one or not, excuse me, it's whether or not it's greater than one. So it's, it's going to be out of phase when alpha beta is greater than one. and it's going to be in phase when alpha beta is less than 1. So that will change, I suppose, that that will change the parity up here. So when alpha beta is greater than 1, the top will become negative, and uh, we're going to get a phase shift. And a phase shift then will, will manifest itself as follows. If you can imagine your sinusoid, it will be inverted. So let's say there's our sinusoid then what will happen is it'll, the, the, the peaks will become troughs and vice versa. Something along those lines. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. So that's all I've got to say about the Fresnel coefficients. They, sometimes people find them quite difficult to, to derive. I hope I helped you in that respect. So thanks for watching. Please pass it on to your friends. Subscribe to my channel. And you might also give me a comment in the box below. Thank you.